Um, how many of you have been in the demo room and saw Kenneth's other demo where he's got voice over IP phones and he's got a PBX running and, it's, and there was no HSM, HSMM harmed in the making of it on that? Uh, okay, how many of you would like to hear a, a little bit about it? Okay, so, so I asked um, Kenneth and I want to thank Tom McDermott for the idea of a lightning talk. So I kind of um, did the ALS challenge to Kenneth to do a lightning talk. So he's got one slide here. So we're going to do a very quick, less than five minutes, lightning talk on Kenneth's voice over IP mesh demo. Okay, take it away, Kenneth. All right, hi, my name's Kenneth, and I'm going to be talking to you again. Uh, so as, as part of my hardware demo in there, which has nothing to do with my thesis, um, Last, last week, I was kind of sitting around, and I realized, hey, you know what I could do? I could put together a meshed voice over IP system between several telephones and a, and a telephone exchange, which should be right there, but apparently there's a bug in LibreOffice that it doesn't do vector files correctly in presentation mode. Um, so imagine that there's a box there that says SIP on it, right? And so I was just going to talk real quick about what I have going on. And again, I'm going I'm to slam into the HSMM guys, because they've done a phenomenal job for enabling us to build meshes without knowing anything about it. They've done a phenomenal job at that. They've done such a good job that you can't find anything out about their systems. I've, I've gone on HSMM and I've read every single shred of document that they've written and released and I have no idea how their systems work. And I don't have the energy right now to install a couple of the, their nodes and start reverse engineering it because I'm getting tired of that. And so I went off last week and I wrote a couple shell scripts and I just built it myself, right? So what I've got is three WRT54Gs in there. Each one of them is running not HSMM's firmware but a stock OpenWRT install. So I went to OpenWRT, installed the last, just the latest version of 10.4 that the WRTs supported. And then I, on each one of them I have this shell script which is available on GitHub where I download it onto the router, I change the host name and the node number, I run it, it downloads, installs all the software I need for it, configures it, and that's it. All right? Unlike the HSMM guys, I think they're using network address translation. I'm actually using addresses in the amateur radio slash eight block, which I haven't seen much of today, which is kind of disappointing. Um, I was crushed when I saw David using 192.168 addresses. Because we have this whole slash 16, 44.128, that's used for these sort of experimental setups. Right? And so on the actual mesh part, which is probably the most interesting, what I'm using is 802.11 ad hoc mode. Right? And so unlike David's mode where he has a master access point and his stations connecting to it, in ad hoc mode it's a completely peer-to-peer -peer connection so that if one of these nodes gets hidden from another node, so if this link were to break, Regardless of, they can both talk to this node, even though one of them may seem more important than the, than the others. All right? And so the, the single point-to-point -point links are relatively easy to set up. What gets difficult is if this, this link right here gets segregated, um, how does this node talk to this node? And that's solved using what's called OLSR, Optimized Link State Routing. OLSR is a routing protocol that I believe the HSMM guys use this. I don't, okay, yeah. Um, where each one of the nodes broadcasts on its, on its Wi-Fi saying, hello, this is my IP address, these are the, se are the people that I can get you to next, and here are the subnets that I am also connected to. Right, so if you look back at this diagram, each one of these nodes broadcasts not only their own IP address, but also the subnet that's hanging off of them, which includes the telephones, right? And so this is, this is kind of the basic how the meshed clients should be, work, should be talking to each other. And so when this phone needs to talk to the SIP exchange, which is here, um, all it knows about is that the, its gateway is here. This router has heard from this router, hey, this is my IP address, I'm connected to this subnet. So if this SIP server were a fixed IP address on the subnet, this phone would say, I need to get to the SIP server. 
this router would say, all right, it needs to go through there, and then this one would be directly connected to it. Um, I went a step further, and I actually ran the same meshing routing that's up here on the Ethernet interfaces. Right, so in addition to any standard client that gets plugged in using DHCP to get an address, I'm using OLSR to route to this invisible SIP server, because, you know, vector files. Um, and so the router here is a fixed IP address. The server here is a fixed IP address. So it, when, you, when I pull this out of the box, out of my duffel bag, I could have plugged the server into any router I wanted because it's all meshed together, right? As far as on the technology side, um, as far as Asterisk, I'm running what's called Asterisk here, which as David said is a fantastic piece of voice over IP software that you want to get in your uh, to-do list as far as what to learn. Um, and so each one of these SIP phones, which I get for about $14 a piece on Surplus, um, they register themselves with the SIP server all right, saying, all right, here's my username and here is my IP address. On the SIP server, I then wrote a, what's called a dial plan, where I said, all right, if any phone dials an extension 203, tell them to go talk to this phone number you know, called SIP ZIP 3, right? The dial plan in Asterisk is phenomenally flexible in that you don't have to map single extensions to single phones. You can map a ring every phone extension. And so if you, if you wanted to have an extension that rings every single phone in the network, you can do it. If you wanted to, um, like in my demo, I actually have a conference call set up. So if you dial HAM or 426, it will put you into a conference room where you can have as many of these telephones talking to each other as you like. Um, let's see, what was the other thing? Uh, I haven't well documented this, the, the actual SIP server yet on the GitHub, but that's gonna be coming and I'm gonna start doing all sorts of blog posts on my uh, personal website, uh, blog.thelifeofkenneth.com. But since this all happened last week, I haven't actually written it up yet. Um, other than that, I guess I'm gonna trash on the WRT54Gs WRT a little bit here. Um, they're starting to show their age, right? We've been, playing, we, we've been playing with these things for 12 years now, and they are really starting to show their age. They're only 802.11G, which, I mean, saying that something's only 54 megabits right after I gave a presentation on 1200 baud is a little ironic. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna play both sides of the card here, but they're only 802.11G, they're not MIMO, they have two antennas because they've got a antenna switch in them, so it's, it's received diversity, there's only one transceiver in them. These things are, they have jitter like crazy. Right, so the fact that the, the demo I have in there working right now is only because these, these WRTs are two feet away from each other. I set up a two kilometer link with WRTs and I was seeing latency on an unloaded link jumping between 20 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds, which is a little annoying for voice over P stuff. So the fact that I've got that demo working in there is a little deceptive. Um, and I, I would encourage if any of you wanna unplug one of those nodes and walk around the hotel with it and see how it fails, by all means, um, the, the Linksys WRTs are, are really, they're starting to show their age, um, which is kind of nice because you can pick them up in lots of like 15 or 20 on eBay now, but they're not really the right tool for what we're trying to do for a lot of this stuff. So um, I've, I've done actual, I've, I've done a lot of deployments with Ubiquiti stuff like David showed, and that stuff's much better. Um, the Linksys stuff are decent routers on, on the, on the near end, but they aren't, they just, they weren't made for the long distance point to point links that, we're, that we've been trying to get them to do, right? So there's a lot of problems in the actual Wi-Fi part, um, and they're, they're a little annoyingly small in the fact that they only have four megabytes of flash, but they're decent, very low end routers. So they have their applications, but that's about it, all right? So other than that, um, by all means, I'll be in there. You can wave me down later if you have any specific all questions right, very, on this. Very quick, very quick questions. All right. I, I just want to point out to HSMM and everyone who works on this that OpenWRT supports at least 100 different routers. Yes. And that it just makes zero sense to be working on this old hardware. Yes. And, and that's kind of the difference 
this shell script should run on pretty much any device and just work, right? So if you have anything that supports um, OpenWRT, uh, that shell script should just run on it and you'll have a mesh node. You'll have to do a few tweaks on it based on the exact interfaces, but um, binding ourselves to things as WRT54G and then finally they're coming out with a um, ubiquity firmware image I was unimpressed by that, right? Is we, we should, be, if this is a mesh between an arbitrary number of nodes, we should make the nodes arbitrary. So. Okay, one last question. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, a, lot of, a problem with these amateur radio protocols is the fact that you can't use encryption. So how do you handle the routing securely because anybody could send advertisements? Ah, yes. So um, Bruce Perrins and I have been butting heads on this for a long time. Um, I finally have come to the conclusion that the way around part 97 for these sort of mesh networks is to not use part 97. <laughs> right? I hate to say it, but part 15 gets you a really long way. I've done six, seven, eight kilometer links with part 15, and then I'm free to use any encryption and any SSH protocol, and it's, it's just not feasible to try and get to get an IP link to be part 97 link legal. So um, I won't discourage anyone from trying, but until part 97 gets sufficiently rewritten, screw it, I'm just gonna do part 15. And there you have it. <laughs>